Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, part of Hulik's webinar series on shaping the post-pandemic world. My name is Preet Olak, and I'm the Associate Dean of Research at Hulik. I'll be hosting the webinar and moderating the Q&A session. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, here's a, a quick uh, agenda for today's webinar. Uh, we'll start with some brief uh, introductions. This will be followed by the formal presentation of a panel of speakers. Uh, so, uh, it gives me uh, great pleasure in introducing today's panel leader, Professor Jim Clayton. Uh, Professor Clayton is the Timothy R. Price Chair and Director of the Brookfield Center in Real Estate and Infrastructure at the Schulich School of Business. He returned to academia and Canada in 2018 after a decade in the institutional investment management industry. Most recently as head of real estate investment strategy and analytics at Bearings in the US. At Bearings and its predecessor, Cornerstone Real Estate Advisors, uh, Professor Clayton was responsible for monitoring and forecasting real estate investments and capital market trends, advising on fund and client investment, risk analytics, and portfolio strategy, and delivering uh, applied research and strategic thought pieces. Uh, Professor Clayton and, and his fellow panelists will share with us their perspectives on cities after COVID-19, rethinking how and where we live, work, shop, play and learn. So now I'll request Professor Clayton to take over, introduce the panelists and then uh, get started on, on their talk. Jip. Thanks very much, Preet. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening depending on where you are. Thank you very much to everybody for joining us. Uh, I know it's, uh, it's kind of webinar season. There's been quite a few of those, a lot going on. Uh, we're, we're very proud of the Schulich series. It's a little bit different, kind of a, something that we have a strong belief in is the combination, combining, connecting with industry and academics and engaging the community with our students as well. Um, so what we want to do today and spend about 30 minutes going through a bit of a formal presentation. You'll hear some different voices. Um, then we'll get into some Q&A. Uh, there's a number of us joining and I'll get into to all the players in just a second. But kind of first I wanna just step back and I wanna sort of say kudos to Ashwin, Preet, Vito, Chris Carter and the rest of the team for initiating this, planning it, putting it together. And also um, really wanna congratulate them for putting us in a perfect spot. I don't know if it was a coin flip in terms of where things went or there was a fit, but this is kind of great to be where we are. A um, couple of things with that. You've heard a lot of discussion on the previous webinars that are focused on businesses, consumers, and people. All of those elements, entities, are crucial to real estate. All of them also use real estate, land, and infrastructure as a factor of production or a place to live. So we're going to add that component to it. The one interesting thing on the, the top picture on the right that was the theme for the series, um, you couldn't do this without having a session on cities. Look where those people are. They're walking across the street. It actually looks big enough, that intersection, to have social distancing. And it's going to fit perfect with the seminar that, webinar that's coming on Thursday, which is going to be talking about uh, can, which is going to be talking about uh, about luxury fashion and you got high street right behind you there. But from our perspective, what we want to do is we want to talk a lot about what's going on with those people. Um, what's going to happen with how they work, live, commute, think about the world, think about each other. Um, that's where we're going to head as we go through uh, this the discussion. I'm going to go for about uh, 15 minutes, maybe hopefully a little bit less, including a few polling questions. I'm joined by my Brookfield Center colleagues. Uh, Professor James McKellar, Avis Devine, um, Sharina Hussain, and Andre Kuzmicki. Um, one of the things that we really focus on in this group is treating real estate and cities as very multidisciplinary and coming at it from really different perspectives. We're not just a finance and economics group. Um, everybody knows James McKellar is an architect and focused on sustainability and infrastructure. Avis, finance background, but really, really focused on sustainability, ESG, as she's going to talk about in her research and her teaching. Sharina, a lawyer by background, focused on transactions, um, uh, really pivoted and is now focused on infrastructure as an asset class and, and leading the academic part of our, our infrastructure leadership network. 
Andre is our executive in residence. Most of you will know Andre, long time participant with James in driving this program and, and connecting with alumni and, and really making the community and engagement what it is. And Andre is with us in the capacity of helping mentor our students and keeping that community alive and innovative, which we're doing as, and we'll talk a bit about as we go through um, the series here. And one thing I'll point out in relation to, to Andre and, and this whole group here, this isn't it. The five of us plus our, our, our star coordinator, center director, uh, Bryna, uh, Brian Abtan, this is it. We also have a really engaged alumni, amazing sessional instructors from industry, and I'll come back to the alumni for one second, uh, led by Christian Peterson and a great ex new executive. The SRPAA is really giving back and involved in a webinar tomorrow, starting the first episode of multiple over a series to help our students deal with this challenging environment, to talk about career advice, um, to really give back, and I urge you um, to participate in that. All four, four of these folks, plus myself, we're all on LinkedIn. You can find our email addresses at the Shulik website. Reach out. Information about that webinar is there as well. So we've got a whole community, and, and thank you to all of you for joining today. So um, by way of background, what I want to do is just talk a little bit about cities, what's going on, some of the academic theory, if you will, about why they exist. Um, we can't talk about where they're going if we don't have an idea about the fundamentals of some of the basic economics of, of cities. And urban economics and spatial economics is a key component. James will correct me right now and say a lot more of it has to do with the design of those buildings and the streets and, and of course that's important. Um, but, but we'll talk about the big picture stuff first. Okay, so a couple things going on. And what I wanna do is convince you that a lot of what we're seeing right now that is accelerating was already going on before COVID. We're just picking up the pace and now we have to adapt at a much quicker speed and we do have some shocks. But over the past couple of decades, the world has become much more of an urbanized place. It used to be really production manufacturing based uh, that drove cities, but today it's, it's human capital, it's the knowledge-based economy and cities have become an ecosystem for business formation, innovation, economic growth, and I would say even consumption on on the household perspective, and that's gonna be a big component, especially for the revival of downtowns in the States and the success that Toronto has had. But urban population is increasing as a proportion of total. Cities are becoming more important. We can get into that. I'm gonna go through these slides very quickly just to, to set the stage. To McKinsey Institute estimates, and this is a couple of years out of date, that high 80s, close to 90% of global GDP growth is generated in cities and it's very concentrated or skewed. A small number of cities account disproportionately, especially in the US and in parts of Europe and in Canada for sure, um, for that GDP. Um, people like to bash and not like cities if you're not a city person. Uh, why I picked that song um, that started out with Scotty McCreary for two reasons. Starts out with big city concrete or small town. Small town guy, you don't have to be one or the other, you can be both. And the in-between relates to a lot of what we're gonna talk about um, people want to put labels on things at one end or the other. They want to polarize things. Um, but you can be in between or a hybrid. Flexibility is where we're going to go. Before I keep going, we would like to know a little bit about you, the audience. So I would like to ask Vito to launch our first poll, one of four, that we're going to do to get a, a feel for who's in our audience and what you're thinking a bit about in this Jim, it looks like you've got 54% in the urban core, 39% in the suburbs, and 6% in the country. Perfect. Thank you. So a good, a good mix of the suburbs. And I'll get you to do that again, Avis. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Okay, let's do that. Launch the second question. So we did, we did live. Now let's talk about work. Okay, we've got a little bit less. Uh, in the city, 47% downtown or CBD, 33% suburban, and 20% from home. Although I bet that number is a little higher at this exact moment. It could be. So I'm very interested. So we have a significant number of you that do not work in a downtown core, which is refreshing because I think we sometimes in today's discussion, I'm not saying it's refreshing and that we think you might not think you should be closer in for various reasons, but we do have a lot of activity that goes on and we tend to focus a lot of our attention on that downtown core as if it's the only place that matters, uh, especially in older cities. 
And let's, we got two more quick ones here, Vita. Let's launch the third one that talks a little bit about public transit. So if, if this is pre-COVID, how did, how doesn't talk just about public transit, but your commuting method to getting to work pre-COVID. How did, how did you get to your place of employment for your, on your commute? Okay, heavy on the car. Auto drive alone is 47%. Uh, ride sharing or carpool is 2%. And public transit is 40%, 6% walk, 4% bike, and just a little bit of other. That's incredible. Thank you. And I'm actually surprised that the 47% isn't a lot bigger in many ways, but that 40% public transit is incredibly important to the discussion going forward. And the, the question is, what's it going to take to get many of you back on that public transit that we need for a regional, cohesive regional mobility uh, or infrastructure network in, in this area? Um, there's a lot of push. We can't keep going in questions, but we can, or uh, here, but we can do it in the Q&A. As you've seen from the headlines, a lot of folks on Twitter and other places, there's a lot of folks pushing for those bikes for, for, for kind of permanent commute. Um, last question, I believe we have a fourth one. I think, you know, on your perception of cities pre and post or pre and during COVID, has your perception of cities changed? We can talk about why later on. Hey, we've got just over 50% that said their opinion hasn't changed with 27% that say it has, I'm sorry, we got 50% that say it has changed, 27% said it hasn't, and 22% that are not sure. <laughs> Excellent, okay, so that's a pretty significant number of people that are maybe thinking something's going on with cities during this episode and, and for the future. So we're, we can come back to that in the Q&A, thank you very much for that. Okay, a couple of things, and again, I'm gonna go through these quickly to set the stage. Uh, this is how I think, and maybe we, but I think about cities. Uh, cities are real estate infrastructure and people. And the people part actually goes back to the infrastructure and real estate. Those businesses are incredibly people intensive. Relationships matter, and we'll talk about that. But in a lot of schools, you study just real estate. Um, you don't necessarily think about cities. It's more finance oriented. But we've got this as a part of thinking about where we're investing in, and that's cities. Real estate combines urban economics and finance, architecture, and all those other things. But most important, it's got location. The one thing that you've heard about in, in previous webinars in terms of the economic impact that Irene gave and, and more corporate-based discussions that you heard before is the fact that those are general discussions that were talking about the economy, people, regions, but they didn't get into location. And urban economics adds the spatial component. The last, third question you had, every one of us has to commute to something. We have to get, transportation is important. Uh, firms have to get their inputs and their outputs. Um, the, the supply chain discussion that, that David Johnson had early in the series crucially depends on transportation and location. Infrastructure embodies both physical and social. We'll talk more about that. People, most important thing there obviously is the number of them, but demographics. Demographics is massive, uh, can cause significant good and bad, depending on what's going on in terms of the numbers for demand for space, but also immigration um, and, and the key characteristics of the demographic generations as they move through time. Okay, so what's happening now? Um, in a previous webinar, Matthias talked a lot about history and, and used a quote that uh, history does not peep, repeat, but it rhymes. So we'll, we'll use a Yogi Berra one, I think, or somebody's came up with this, that the future is not what it used to be. What are we doing now? I think you might agree that a lot of us, especially the 50% of you that answered, you're thinking differently about cities, are reconsidering a lot of things. Maybe as you work at home, maybe as you spend more time with family, maybe as that's both good and bad, uh, as you try and work from home. Um, a lot of reimagining, remaking, people are taking a pause. Pause to reflect, and how did we get here? Was there something we could have done, or what was happening as we came in here that maybe wasn't the great of things, that a good economy was sort of masking but there were some underlying issues. And, and that could any, be anything from income inequality, the role of government, concern for the environment. I've sort of listed a whole bunch of things over there. Two of them I'm gonna hit on for a second. The very bottom one, relationships and trust. Uh, we're gonna talk later about why cities exist. Uh, people, relationships, having that handshake that we can't have right now, trust. Blake Hutchison uh, that gave, that 
current head of Omers and former head of Oxford Properties, uh, gave our perspectives lecture a couple of years ago. And I remember the one line, and I think he says this a lot, that business moves at the speed of trust. Um, and, and that relationship part is key. The other thing I'm going to point out is my options and flexibility point there. I think a lot of people, as uh, my song said, want to put things in a box, either or. I think as we go forward, all this reflecting means we want more choice. We have to do what works well for us and for our employees. And options and flexibility. We want more of a choice menu. Uh, whether Just like you can probably buy car insurance or house insurance with all kinds of choice. And in the States, definitely health insurance. But we want more choice. What works good for us? Um, the other thing I just want to mention, and I hinted at this before, is that you have to recognize that a lot of these forces were at work coming in to the COVID situation. Not all of these are new, they're accelerating. To prove that, um, I've got an old slide here. This is four years old. I've been using it, I used it at client conferences. This book came out in 2016. Uh, Thomas Friedman in the New York Times really was focused on the intersection of the three forces in blue, technology, globalization, and climate change. I've added demographics and urbanization for what we're talking about here today with cities. But we were already thinking about this. It was, it was incredibly important. Um, so it was 2016, I'll answer that one myself. A danger with a lot of people making claims about what this episode is going to do, predictions about the future, especially with structural change, always a bit dicey. Um, death of di distance. Um, I can't see the chat because I've got both of this on full screen, but what year do you, just what year do you think this came out? The death of distance. The internet was going to make distance, how we conduct our business and personal lives become irrelevant. It was going to be the end of conferences. It was going to be the end of cities. It was going to be significant reduced demand for office space in the urban core. We were all going to work from our cottages or the beach. Sound kind of familiar? Um, it wasn't related to a nasty virus hitting the whole world, but it was, it did happen. What, Avis, are you there again? Throw out, what, what year are we seeing if people are guessing? We've got 92 and 2000. That's it, eh? Oh, well, yeah. close, in between, 97. Um, an expanded and totally rewritten version came out in 2001. What, what happened since these books came out? Well, the internet bubble happened, and then CBD office markets in global cities flourished. Toronto's downtown vacancy is at 2%. Maybe that's about to change, but, but we'll see. This has happened around the world in select markets. We regain momentum. The exact opposite happened. And Ed Glazer, one of the pioneers of urban economics from Hartford, Hart, Harvard, sort of summarizes this really nicely. The central paradox of the modern metropolis. Proximity has become even more valuable as the cost of connecting across long distances has fallen. Um, so we need those face-to-face -face contacts even more. Those relationships are even more. Um, today, here's what we're seeing. Death of the office from The Economist. The office is dead. These are bad choices. I wish they didn't use the word death in this environment. But, you know, the, the point is they're trying to be dramatic. Is it going to happen? Um, more balanced treatment. If you look at Great West Life Realty Advisors, last week they put out a much nicer piece. Instead of just giving these headlines, look below the surface. Ask the right questions. Why do people go to offices? There's productivity benefits. Maybe we can get some of those at home and we can talk about those. Again, I think it'll be a hybrid or a blend, but there are good reasons. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not all doom and gloom. Very quickly on this one, just a, a recent survey about the state of remote work, an interesting company named Buffer. The biggest benefit, obviously, to working from home, flexible schedule, there's that flexibility I mentioned. Work from anywhere, not having to commute, right? The 40% of you in public transit, 47 in your car, that deal with that, not having to commute. Downside, of course, a couple of these are important. The most important one I find interesting is loneliness. People are social animals and not being able to disconnect is the other one. So just, there's a, there, it's not one or the other, it's, it's in between. And not all jobs can be done at home. I've provided a few references as we go through here, but given the time, I'm gonna kind of blow through these to set the stage. A couple of big themes that we're going to talk about that we think are important that you saw in my Rethink, Reimagine slide. Social inclusion. It's, there's a lot of polarization that goes on. That if you're not following it at all, the New York Times has an interesting series going on, The America We Need. Now is the time to embrace density. There's an interesting piece from somebody about housing affordability. 
Professor McKellar was quoted in the Toronto Star in a lengthy article yesterday about the same topic, the missing middle. We, we, right now, we just have single detached homes and very tall condo and apartment buildings. What about that whole bit in between? Uh, a lot of interesting stuff there. The graph on the right just shows the income issue and how it connects to the disease and other social concerns. The top 1% income earners in New York, uh, roughly 35% or 25% of them left very quickly and were able to do that. Others couldn't, and those others probably take public transit. Climate change, uh, slide I borrowed from Joe Barrage's uh, Toronto presentation on the accidental metropolis, center island underwater. So we'll get into some of that. Before I head off and into my, my colleagues making their presentations on more specific specialties, I wanna just take one quick step back. Since we are an academic institution, let's go back to school for a second. Why do cities even exist? If we're gonna talk about how they change, we're gonna have opinions. Why do they exist? How do they change over time? A few resources there, some of what we use in our urban economics or economic forces class. And one thing in particular at the bottom, when we say cities here through this whole discussion, I'm not talking about a political definition. I'm talking about an economic definition. It could be a metro area, it could be a region, but it's an rel area of relatively high population and employment density. Uh, in addition to our panelists, I'm gonna bring in one more individual. I'm going to bring in, uh, at least with a picture, Elaine Bertaud, uh, a really interesting planner by background who's now at NYU, who wrote a book that essentially says that planners don't know economics and urban economists don't know how to communicate or know what's going on on the ground on cities. So how about you guys all get together? And, but he has one quote that I, kind of forms the basis of why I want to show a couple slides. I think worldwide the unfamiliarity with basic urban economic concepts by those managing cities is a major problem of our time. Uh, we need to understand the forces that you can't be sort of in the way of or you need to learn how to nudge. Uh, a few resources if you want to take a look at a video. Long before we had to go asynchronous, with, uh, there, there are videos and other things out there. But the biggest reason that cities exist is because clustering or proximity is very, very beneficial. For sharing things, infrastructure, input suppliers are key, especially the infrastructure, roadways, airports, public transit, etc. But the biggest ones in my mind are the learning and creating ideas. Um, what I've labeled there is the chemistry of the unexpected or serendipity serendip of intersection, building personal relationships. That could even be stealing ideas if you're in a high tech area, but it's, a, it's the notion that you've got these chance encounters, even in a lunchroom in your office building. Everything we say here relates to working in an office as well labor market pooling and matching. You're more likely to be able to get a job if you lose your job or if you're spouse and you're matched. So a lot of these key things are economic drivers that mean big cities are more productive or you going to a city are potentially more productive and do better in a big city versus a smaller one. Of course, they've got small one, or problems as well and we'll come back to that. But basically there's increasing returns to spatial concentration and these are self-reinforcing. The principle of median location says that many firms are gonna locate in the middle of the biggest population for the market. And these days, more companies are locating where people want to be, um, as opposed to people having to chase the companies. And there are, there are negatives, but that means that the, it's also about consumption in these cities. Demographics means a lot. And on the negative side, uh, on the negative side, down at the bottom of the right in this slide, of course, we've got congestion, housing affordability, pollution, crime, things that we'll talk about that offset and I've just given you a simple picture that shows in general, wages tend to go up with city size, cost of living goes way up, and, and there is a balance, there's an offset, there's a maximum size to your city, unless you're doing things to reduce that cost of living and maximize that wage curve. And we'll refer to these as centripetal and centrifugal forces. But in light of time, I don't wanna keep going too long here. I've provided a nice reference of a very recent article that again brings cities back to people and, and essentially argues that they're more like a combination of biology and psychology than, than it is physics. It's in the publication called Nature, Human Behavior, but essentially goes through and shows that patents and GDP and employment are much more productive and very nonlinear to some extent in big cities because of social networks, connections to universities and research cities. The, the conclusion that I'll just go in red is that complex knowledge in our knowledge-based economy today does not travel well through digital communication channels, requires cities to be accumulated. 
I find that very interesting. It came out right before COVID in January, and we're talking about digital and the work from home, et cetera. Last thing I'm going to talk about is the shape of cities. Three major forces, politics, unfortunately, a two to four year cycle, economics in real estate and infrastructure, a long term cycle, very different. And transportation is key. And we can get into that. It determines form. And we've got a lot of change going on there as the question in it. Last thing is that cities became the focus of the National Geographic back in April 2019. Interesting TED talk by new urbanism pioneer and, if you will, Peter Cuthbert, a planner down at the bottom, but also claiming that cities, we, to save cities, we have to get out of the car. Well, I'm not sure we can completely do that, and we'll come back to that discussion, but we certainly need multiple modes of mobility. So with that quick blow through, um, we'll come back to full Q&A a little bit after I hear from my colleagues. Um, I'd like to ask James to unmute and just give a few comments, James, on where you see things going. I know when we've been talking about this, you've had some interesting thoughts, especially based on what you're hearing others say on a lot of the webinars. Yeah, I'll, I'll just make my uh, comments brief. Uh, I'm using a number that I can't defend, uh, and that is that about two-thirds of uh, what we had uh, pre-COVID um, will exist uh, uh, in, uh, in the post-COVID era. Uh, the problem is uh, of that two-thirds, one-third split, we don't know what's going to fit in the one-third and what's going to fit in the two-thirds. And the reason is that everything is predicated on the extent to which our human behavior is going to be modified. Will we get back on transit? Will we take uh, uh, international flights? Um, will schools go back in, into classrooms? And um, it's a guessing game and it's a very difficult one. Uh, I was on a webinar last week at Harvard and a very well-known uh, educator uh, said that 90% of universities in the U.S. will fail and only 10% will, uh, uh, will survive by 2050. So a lot of people are guessing. Um, I don't want to guess, um, but I am saying that there's that one-third that is going to shift. And so it comes back to your comment, Jim, about people. And that is we're going to have to watch people very carefully. And why they're going to change is that there is a deep-seated trauma as a result of COVID. Uh, people have uh, uh, much more uncertainty in their lives. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see uh, to what extent they will go back to their old shopping habits, uh, to their, you know, buying their twice-daily coffee, et cetera. Um, and so uh, that's really the challenge that we have. I would agree with you. Cities aren't going to go away. But the trick now is what are we going to invest in today that's going to make sure that that one-third change is going to be positive and is going to make the city uh, address. And I just want to finally uh, one point. Um, cities are, are, are great if you're wealthy and they're cruel if you're not. And if I had to say, if there's one challenge we have in shaping the future city, it's to deal with issues of social equity, get away from this nonsense about smart cities, data and censoring, and start to understand that we have to house the people that service us. Uh, we have to deal with the aging, we have to deal with the homeless. And that's a challenge for infrastructure and real estate going forward. Great, that was a great comments, James. And that goes back to some of the New York Times piece series I was mentioning and some of what we mentioned earlier with even if it goes back to the sort of missing middle your inclusive nature and I was talking to president of one of the major development firms in town who's going to speak in a class in a couple of weeks and he was making a lot of the same points and really arguing that there's this new push for inclusive principles that we have to have a bigger view than just a developer making money we have to, a sustainable long-term viable city has to consider that inequality and housing more people, and hopefully this will will do that. That's kind of a good uh, lead-in over to Avis, because Avis uh, is a big proponent of the ESG side and if, uh, has an interesting slide that really mentions that 
we're then missing the S part, which you could connect with what James was just talking about. So over to Avis for her comments. Indeed. I mean, in general, James and I come from a uh, very different point of view when we both approach the questions of sustainability, but uh, a lot of what we're saying overlaps right now. And that is, for me, as soon as this started happening, what I saw immediately was that we're finally going to start talking about the S in ESG. And by we, I mean the majority of us, we, not just uh, a few firms. There are some real thought leaders uh, in terms of um, corporate, especially corporate commercial real estate that have been thinking about the social uh, as well as the environmental and governance. But for the most part, when we talk about ESG up until now, we've been focusing on the E and the G. And recently, of course, particularly on the E. Now, part of that is just because of data availability. We know we're learning now how to measure the E and the G. It's very difficult to measure the S. And so we're still in that process of only trying to figure out how we measure it and then collect the data and then give us enough time so that we can see how moving the levers on some of these issues actually impacts our performance valuation and operations. Uh, but I think we're going to start to see the S really rise in the ESG conversation. And we're going to see sustainability become a much more robust three-legged stool. We're already starting to see impacts of this. If we think about health and safety execution within homes, uh, in public spaces, in offices, uh, when we think about the implications of work from home, you know, at first it was just how do we function? And then you gave us all a month and it was, let's think about the ergonomics of the space you're working in all day long. Because apparently our dining room tables are not meant for us to work at all day long for a variety of height related reasons and all of that. So those are kind of the kind of aspects that we just haven't thought about yet. Um, the conversation about rebalancing of road space. I did see a comment passed by earlier about the question with regards to uh, that poll we took in terms of how we all get to work, whether or not the push for more bike lanes is justifiable. If 4% of this crowd uh, bikes to work, the, the question may be uh, not, um, should we change all to bike lanes because 4% do, but if we did change the bike lanes, how many would? Uh, those are the kind of questions we're starting to think about as we rebalance our road space to uh, not only distribute pedestrians and bikers and cars, but also think about who lives at the top of that hierarchy. In many other countries, you'll find that pedestrians or bikers live at the top, whereas here, I would say it's still very much the cars. And of course, the last thing and most important thing when it comes down to it uh, is if you want to see what's going to shape what we uptake, follow the consumer consumption. Excellent point, Davis. I like the one in particular about just because somebody, the categories that were answered doesn't mean they can't change. People can, people can adapt. As James hit it, at, hit, one third of this is going to depend on consumer behavior, psyche, sentiment, potentially changing. And you can't change if you don't have those options. Uh, particularly, I, I like that. Particularly with respect to transportation, we may only have 4% who bike right now, but also, we had a question in the Q&A section that was posed about people and their unwillingness to get on public transit right now. Well, yeah. while that's certainly the case, maybe instead of seeing everyone being pushed out of the subway and into one-off car trips, maybe they're getting pushed out of the subway and into bikes. And if we can even moderate some of that redistribution, it can help us manage the E and the ESG. Or, yeah, or, or again, offering more flexibility so that People don't necessarily have to do work from home all the time or work from the office, but they have the option to do both. Um, and, and if you've seen any of the press that has come with Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, who's actually arguing office space demand is going to go up significantly as companies are actually going to spread out and have more of a hub and spoke system. And we have to have more space per person um, within offices that had shrunk dramatically as we, as we densified. So, with those comments, and especially the ergonomic ones, I'm going to turn to Sharina at her dining room table. Sharina, what real estate and infrastructure, we've got infrastructure is key, especially in aging cities like Toronto that have maybe not kept up and are trying to catch up, New York and others. What, are, what do you see going on in the infrastructure world 
what are the issues at this time? Well, based on a lot of the themes that we talked about today, some of the trends that we're seeing emerge in infrastructure were also endemic far before COVID had materialized. That being said, when we think about aviation, public transit use, our digital infrastructure, such as your broadband capabilities, um, we're beginning to physically, noticeably identify some of the challenges related to resiliency of our infrastructure. And more immediately, when we think back to what James mentioned about the impact of human behavior and how trauma can otherwise shift behaviors, we're beginning to see the human impact of COVID, particularly as it relates to the otherwise absence of reinvesting in some of our social infrastructure, such as in long-term care facilities, affordable housing, um, rural access, or even suburban access to broadband internet. And with recognition of some of the, the, the direct impact that COVID has been having on those social infrastructure classes, you're now beginning to see a shift in the priorities that cities and other forms of governments are having as it relates to thinking about what infrastructure do we need to now rebuild and refresh or even build anew in order to avoid similar outcomes from occurring not only in the future, but also recognizing that in many jurisdictions, infrastructure has been traditionally seen as a way to stimulate the economy, more immediately putting people back to work. So these two forces are colliding in order to cause um, many decision makers, whether in the public or private sector, to begin to rethink what infrastructure do we need, particularly in cities, in order to come out of a pandemic experience. And I like to think of this as this idea of these social infrastructure demands now crowding in what were otherwise seen as the more economic driving infrastructure, such as airports, forms of high scale or ports that were traditionally seen as being of significant importance as it relates to ensuring we have global trade patterns. Now we're seeing competition emerge as to where do governments put their money. Um, James touched upon affordable housing. Well, you can rest assured that that is going to be a decision that has to be dealt with in addition to seniors care and health care more broadly as it relates to thinking about where our infrastructure priorities will lie in the next six to 18 months. That being said, um, right now, globally, we're experiencing unprecedented levels of government stimulus as it relates to try to soften the blow that COVID and re COVID related economic shutdowns are having um, among cities, but also rural areas more broadly. If we think about infrastructure being very intensive, long term and requires a significant amount of resources just to mobilize and develop, you're going to quickly realize that governments don't necessarily have the resource available to then engage in this very ambitious infrastructure agenda to rebuild our, our city and, and our broader spaces. That is where you're beginning to see quite a lot of creativity in reimagining the different business models and transaction arrangements that will be introduced in order to facilitate the rebuilding of our infrastructure. And that rebuilding exercise will largely encompass different forms of private or non-government capital. Um, they can come from more traditional sources like banks or investment funds. Um, some large institutional investors such as pension funds have been gradually increasing their allocations to infrastructure over the past decade. Now, they're very much recognizing how then could they be part of deploying their capital in a way that's able to then meet these infrastructure agendas, but also in a way that generates returns for their plan beneficiaries. So turning our attention to the perspective of the role of private enterprise in this, in this rebuilding exercise, it's very much a recognition that the next 16 to 18 months will be very telling as it relates to how our infrastructure priorities, specifically in cities, will unfold for the next decade. And what do I mean by that? Many infrastructure um, investors or even private capital providers are now currently trying to manage liquidity crises. They're also trying to be able to get their current assets up and running. Think of uh, an airport, for example, in Eastern Europe, in which case, um, there might be some form of private ownership, but air travel has dropped to dramatically low levels. 
how do you keep that airport um, fiscally uh, up and running? So that's something that in the short term, a lot of private capital providers are thinking about. But going back to the theme of this presentation, namely, what is the long-term implications? That's where we're beginning to think about how human behavior is going to change in response to our experiences with COVID. And that's where you're gonna see um, this this idea of infrastructure as an asset class also adopt and respond to how they can be part of that shift in order to respond to changing long-term um, usage and demand patterns related to infrastructure, as well as lever leveraging new business models and technologies in order to deliver a similar experience. Great, thank you, sir. So clearly the world's gonna change from the perspective of the provision of capital for infrastructure. We are in an amazing unpresented Precedented time in terms of the money that governments have, have put in and uh, So we already saw that happening. It's going to have to change and, and uh, if I take what you're saying is that and it's already sort of happening with the comment I made earlier it's, it's happening on the social infrastructure and the hard infrastructure sides and there's a lot of room for creativity and opportunity um, Although I, I shouldn't even say this, but you know if I reference uh, what happened at a certain park in Toronto with a lot of people over the weekend the younger generation doesn't really seem to care that they're gonna have to pay for all this in the future but I, I, I digress although that might show that people are not averse to cities and proximity so we've gone a little bit long uh, the polling questions and a few other things so um, I'm gonna turn it over to Preet for Q&A and, and Preet as we discussed very happy to stay on a little longer Thanks, uh, everyone. And we have actually a number of questions. Uh, so I just want to tell our audience that we may be going uh, over for a few minutes. Uh, so let's see how uh, things go. Uh, we have a few questions. If you still are thinking about some burning questions you may have, uh, please do uh, submit those. So we're going. Uh, I'm going to start with two questions, uh, which are related to basically the retail uh, space. Uh, so there's a question from Don Thompson, uh, who's asked, uh, and that's a question for Jim. Uh, what is your five-year outlook for shopping centers, given the demise of anchor tenants and, de and department stores that we are seeing in the U.S. with more, uh, with more to come? I don't think Don read the disclaimer on our webinar that we're not talking about specific property sectors. Oh, I'm joking. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll say that it's a lot better than it is south of the border. Um, and what we've always talked about um, in terms of retail, even where, where I was, was A centers are going to continue to, to dominate and probably have a good opportunity. Clearly the ones that don't have street front right now are suffering as the rest opens up a little bit in a constrained manner. But from my perspective, yeah, you've got, you've got a, a total shift that has been reinforced from a transition from retail to e-tail to industrial that is all being blended and was causing the disruption in the supply chain that was talked about. But I think it all comes down to the land and the location. A lot of that retail can be repurposed as we're seeing with some of the real estate investment trusts that at one time were focused only on retail, are more focused on alternative so-called niche property sectors and mixed use development. I think we're gonna see a lot of that, especially if you're anywhere near some of this expanding transportation network um, and or the future transportation network expansions that we hope will materialize with the capital Sharina was talking about. But in terms of my exact outlook, um, that's why I'm an academic, not an investment strategist anymore. So I don't have to give numbers. That was another attempt at humor, but we'll see how that okay. goes. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so next question is from Adwell Advale Dada. Uh, uh, the question is, pre-COVID, developers in my jurisdiction drove significant residential slash retail projects in the suburbs that were closest to downtown. Do you anticipate residential office projects will intensify in cities and reflect the death of suburban retail? Definitely. We're, we have a massive shortage of residential. And it's finally in Toronto is a unique animal with the condos. Uh, being a shadow rental market or substantial part of it. And we're finally starting to see so-called purpose-built rentals and, and others. And we need that for different income levels. But yes, I, I think you are seeing that transition towards more residential, especially uh, near transit and if you can densify. Uh, there's a question from Muhammad Jishan uh, about uh, the job scenario. So the question is, what will be the job scenario for expatriates working in the Middle East, Canada and Europe in real estate and infrastructure development. 
as we all know there is a huge percentage of lost jobs during the pandemic i'll let others jump in but i mean clearly it's a little it's a little hard to predict the exact nature of how things as james said with the one third two thirds but it all all that depends on when we get a vaccine if we get a vaccine but i think the real asset side that we're all involved in and the the growth of cities i was talking about means that there's going to be a lot of opportunity and continued opportunity in the in the major global cities but i'll, I'll let others jump in on this one jim it, it uh, it's james i i mean it it goes back to you know the creative destruction and i think there's going to be a huge need for a uh, retraining and changes in competency and that's one of the great things about the uh, online so while jobs are destroyed uh i think a lot of good jobs will be created um society uh does this uh every little every little while so i would be a little skeptical of anyone who thinks that every job is just a matter of going back to where it was um and i think there will be a huge demand for a retraining of uh, the employment sector I also think that based on the tone of this, if they're asking about expats working in Canada, I can only assume that this question is from the US. Uh in which case I think when I think about job implications in the US that are unique to the US as opposed to the same kind of job implications we're going to feel everywhere in the developed world much less the un- the developing world. Uh the big thing that I think we're finally going to start to see in the US is maybe the question about how we manage jobs and healthcare because if anything has highlighted the problem between linking healthcare to employment i would say this situation has uh so we may see the management of that relationship addressed more directly and that could create some complications especially as it uh I mean, that's the kind of thing that might be uh, adjustable more quickly with large firms and deep pockets. But when you're looking at the smaller businesses that are already strained, the current operating scenario, um, how that is managed, if it is addressed, uh, could add additional strain. Thanks. Uh, there's a question from Jane Gotson, uh, and the question is: Do you see increased indigenous influence in city design? The values seem a better fit for the city we want than the city we have. um i i i would find it difficult to connect the dots um because uh they they there's just so many different uh differences culturally values etc i would agree that uh city dwellers may want to become a little more um self uh uh subsidence in other words they maybe people will be able to actually learn how to cook a meal or grow something but um i i don't know if connecting those dots is going to be very easy well if i can add on that and if this is jim this is going back historically in how cities have been designed if you look at cities such as uh paris new york and some more modern planning theories you are seeing um response to the spread of disease having a direct impact on how we plan um our streetscapes for example having wider sidewalks in certain places like in paris or avoiding shadows in places like new york or even having the wide open spaces that is known as central park so whether it's indigenous or other forms of design principles um recognizing that there could be other forms of influences such as a pandemic can have a direct impact on how we design or redesign our city spaces that's a good point hey priya i'd love to at this time i think it's perfect chance to bring andre in and give him a an opportunity to sort of give his thoughts on what he's heard from this group and some of the questions that he's seeing coming in well uh you know i i a lot of what i i've heard from my colleagues in this presentation has to do with people it has to do with behaviors it has to do with psychology even word biology with you and um i'd like to just touch on that a little bit but it may be in a slightly different way than than everybody else has because everybody else is really talking about it in terms of aggregates and categories and how people as a as a whole will 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 act in the future but i think it also comes down to very individual choices that that we make um i think one of the things that or the big thing to me that covid uh 
has has uh, revealed to us in ways that we sort of know, but but it's beginning to really come home to roost is just how fragile are the entire system that we rely on and that we operate and that we benefit from, particularly those who benefit from from in the, in the top whether one percent or twenty percent or whatever the number might be, um, and. You know, one of the things that I think they, you know, Jim talked, uh, you talked about a whole bunch of different trends, uh, many of which I agree with. One of which is um, flexibility. And uh, <clears throat> flexibility, which I, I agree, and I think that's a bigger part of our lives, flexibility in many different ways, but flexibility contributes to the resiliency of our, of our system, of, our, of society. But the other part of, of it is, uh, you know, if you just have uh, flexibility, but you don't have strength, then what you have is brittleness, and I think that's what we have seen. That there's a there's something fundamentally that isn't working uh, societally that has allowed this pandemic to have the really a, a terrible uh, uh, effects that in many places it has had so far. And who knows how much longer this will go on, or, or what the longer term effects uh, uh, will be. And all of that seems to me to be. A, and another thing that's been talked about quite a bit today is a social inequity. Um, uh, that's where we see, that's why we see, we have, you know, the other trend I think that hasn't been uh, talked about at all, but is in the background of all of this and really does, I think, feed into everything is, are the sort of uh, sociopolitical trends, the rise of nationalism, populism, even tribalism that is rooted uh, uh, more and more in society, which seems to be, in my mind, it's been exacerbated by COVID-19 and uh, leads me to believe that we're in for a bumpy ride for quite a while, even if we get to a better place uh, in time, it's it's not going to be a straight line uh, getting there from 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 where we are. Um, you know, uh, Avis, you talked about ESG, and uh, I think he, you know that that focus on on those three elements is uh, valuable. It's important, but in my experience, a lot of it is checking boxes. And you know, this is what we have to do, so this is what we do. And we and it's more about the appearance. It's about being able to say yes to the, answer the questions. Uh, uh, rather than necessarily uh, 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 internalize the alt un underlying purpose and reason why those things are so important. Um, what I would touch on is that uh, uh, the, the five of us here uh, 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 on, on the screen and, and probably a large portion of our audience are uh, privileged people. Uh, we have that benefit and uh, we have with, with that privilege comes the ability, the, mo the most influence, we have more influence than anybody else does uh, uh, to make change. And we have to take that challenge on upon ourselves and look within ourselves to say, uh, you know, whether, whether that's uh, a challenge that we want to uh, face up to. And we can't just leave it up to other people, expect government or policymakers spontaneously to make changes that we ourselves are not prepared to embrace and champion. Um, I don't want to take too much time, but I will, uh, uh, you know, a quote from uh, Mitch Goldhar, who was our prospective speaker last year. And, uh, you know, a couple of things that I, I've heard him speak a number of times at length. And uh, he's one of the, my favorite quotes is, there are no big things, only a lot of little things. And then he sort of echoed that in the prospectus lecture when he said, you know, there are no companies, there are no firms, there are no organizations, there are no businesses, there's only people. And I think that's very, very, very true. It all boils down to us as individuals. So I, I would leave it with that. I think that there's a certain wisdom that uh, we all carry within us internally that leads us to make good choices. And we have to get in touch with that wisdom and then act in accordance with that wisdom. And I think that uh, I'll leave it with that. Thanks, Andre. That was that's very, it's a nice way of putting some of the things together. And I, I think I think Avis, would, I won't put words in her mouth, would probably agree that for a while that, that was a lot of check boxes, but we hope we've actually got some serious folks and that this is speeding up and the recognition of some of that for the re main reasons that, that you just, just mentioned. And uh, I, I agree with you, and people are really understanding that side of it. Hey, Preet, if, if you don't mind, as I look through the questions, and I know some people must go that, that – the, uh, the connections that Andre's talking about with people and cities and James' point about affordability and the social and the infant, kind of putting all that together. There's a few questions about density in there, uh, yeah. a book where somebody, and there's a lot of people that talk about how we're all going to, the ideal place is a very dense, lo located with suburbs or bad kind of thing. But you got the thing that, and some, a couple questions also brought in smaller cities. So 
in my mind, you're going to have, when cities grow, the real estate capital is long-term live durable. It stays around for a long time. Cities have to grow two ways, out and up. And then newer cities especially, and then older cities like a Toronto, you're seeing massive redevelopment in because it's now time to redevelop that. So there's a lot of change going on. The other thing to remember is a city doesn't exist in isolation. There's always a system of cities, right? There's it tends to be, there's something called Ziff's law or the rank si rule sign or law rule, rank size rule that there tends to be in nature very few big things, more medium sized things and a lot of smaller things. And Toronto as a whole is, is the whole GTA, which encompasses everything I think from Coburg to Niagara Falls is becoming a region that has to compete. And we have to figure out how people can live in this whole region and handle some of the discrepancies and issues that we're talking about. And the questions about infrastructure, um, Ken Greenberg has a terrific Urban Land Institute article from last month, just before COVID hit, about Toronto changing from a car-oriented designed metropolitan to a multi-mode transportation node with go trains and subways and other, and that's happening and the question is will it happen and go back to the question about will you go in a subway again i deal with that every day as i think about york opening up i moved to where i am because i did not want to drive my car to work i honestly moved because the subway op op went there and so that is a real question that we're all going to have to deal with but it's about whether we get through this this point but if, the, if we get through this, will we treat everybody in a different way and not just think about ourselves and making money per, per se? It's, it's kind of all in this together. That's the, thing, the point that people are making. Okay. Uh, Jim, I wanted to, uh, I think we are almost out of time. I want to throw one question that I had and it could be for all the panelists. Uh, that so far, most of your discussion about cities has been are done in the context of Western, the uh, Western cities. So, you know, North American uh, and, uh, you know, Canadian. And, you know, in, in the developing world, we have been uh, telling people that, you know, for if they want development, if they want uh, mobility, they need to move to the cities. Uh, and, you know, and because that is where what you mentioned, most of the growth is. But the pandemic has also seen now that now those lot of those people have been pushed out of the cities. Uh, so you, you see migrants from uh, in India after the lockdown because you know they, it was more of an informal economy. So they were being pushed out. Uh, so the, the question for me uh, that I have is that how do you see you know in in the rest of the world in the non-developed world the future of cities, especially with the experience that some of them have had with, uh, with COVID and my migration, not inwards, but outwards. Great question. Great question, Preet. Does anybody want to put their hand up for that jump ball? I think Avis is getting eager there. I, I do some research on emerging market countries. Uh, and for me, I do it through an adoption of environmentally sustainable uh, buildings. And it really triggers a couple of things that I think we're often blind to when we spend so much time thinking about how to build big buildings in downtown Toronto. And one of those is that downtown Toronto and Toronto in general um, looks like a suburb compared to a lot of the cities that exist in the rest of the world. And that in general, the density that we have in the Western Hemisphere is, is very low compared to the rest of the world. And that is true both historically, hundreds of years ago, when the East was the dominant, and then the West sort of rose, and now we're seeing the East dominate again. And when the East builds big, uh, they build at a density that uh, makes our concept of density look a little laughable. So the questions that we're struggling with here as we try and figure out how to walk on the street in Toronto and you know, not bump into somebody else who's also walking on the street and I can just go walk in the middle of the road to protect that. Um, the, the way they're addressing that uh, in countries and cities that have density that far exceeds what we deal with is so, it's so much more of a heightened question. And watching how they solve those problems will be a great set of tools for us to take. And the other thing I'd mention is just that uh, I, always, I always frame real estate and infrastructure within the context that it is a slow and lumpy asset, uh, and this is a sudden and uh, vigorous problem, and we need to certainly address it, 
But we also have to be realistic that as we truly build in the, the solutions for any pandemic that is airborne, um, those solutions are not really going to be built in uh, for a while. We're, just, we're not going to see it actually built into the design and execution of our infrastructure and our real estate for a while to come. And again, when you take into consideration the fact that we can watch how the emerging markets do it and then build it into our slow development process, we have the opportunity to make some good choices here in the future and how we handle it, especially in the Western world. And if I can add... Uh, onto that in terms of the infrastructure side of the equation. I do a lot of work in emerging market infrastructure with the G7, in which case what we're seeing is that infrastructure investment priorities are heavily tied to more of the, the social economic um, growth of large segments of the economy or even across the population. And so even is the recognition that in the short term, a lot of those gains that were made in the emerging middle classes in some of those emerging markets might be slowing down. Um, the infrastructure objectives that are being put forward are very much about dealing with, Avis mentioned that that S in the ESG, the, the opportunity to engage larger segments of the population. And if anything, um, we are looking to some emerging markets to get a sense as to what a transaction models are they using in order to you know, redeploy capital, very, very unavailable capital in countries in order to then reshape those in a way that helps to alleviate a lot of the uh, emerging poverty, but also um, ensure that there is an increase in the literacy rates as well as a social up uh, movement in those emerging markets. It's interesting that a lot of those emerging markets that you're talking about, they're, they're relatively new in terms of this infrastructure and what Avis is talking about. They can sort of leapfrog some of the things that are causing us problems today. And that goes back to the gentleman's question about retail and super regional malls and things that are there. But again, again it, I think that shock is just something that I don't think we can deal with policy-wise in terms of the migrants being sent back. It's kind of related to the unemployment that we're seeing here with unprecedented unprecedented amounts, but maybe we need to have a social safety network that, that cares in, in the way that people are talking about people here. Preet, I think we're probably... Yeah, I think, uh, do, you, do you have a few concluding thoughts? So, I, th I thought I would, um, as a bit of a summary, uh, let the 2018 Nobel Prize in Economics have a, a few words to finish off here in a recent conversation. If Paul Romer, who's all at NYU now, um, well, I'm not going to go through all of this, but just as, as the last part of a really interesting uh, discussion that went on with Paul, uh, who had great ideas about that, that what DC should listen to for preventing an economic collapse, but a lot of it ended up relating to cities. And I just want to hit at a few things here that once we get through this, we, we're, not, we're not scientists, medical people that can talk about when and if we're going to have a vaccine, but if we look at history, we, we we will or we'll, we'll figure this out, but uh, there's still value in the cities, even if you have to deal with that. And it comes back to this point about people that Andre mentioned and as others have said, second last bullet. There's a lot to be gained from interaction and close physical proximity. Interaction is a large part of how we establish trust. There was a question we didn't answer about haven't we all kind of figured out this digital communication and it works, but that point about complexity and still needing the, the unexpected face-to-face -face and Blake Hutchison, in his Perspectives Lecture Talk, said that before he did business with people, he would invite them into his soup. He, wanted, he would invite them into his house, and he wanted to have a meal with them, and he wanted to get to know them before you sign a contract. Now, that's leaders, but everybody is kind of like that. So I just like the last quote. So I'm hoping he lives a long time, because he says for the rest of his life, cities are going to continue to be where the action is. So to finish off, based on that and what we've talked about, I thought I would give all the panelists – uh, James had to hop off, and, and others I'm sure did too. One last word, just to maybe one last phrase. And let's start with Andre. Um, Andre, if somebody bumped into you on the street in one of these proximities, well, not bumped into you, it was only six feet apart, uh, what, and asked you city and said cities, they're a problem. Well, what, what's your optimistic view? What, what, what's your, what are you thinking about cities? What's your last word on cities? Wow. <laughs> uh, you know, I love the city. I love living in the city. I agree with all the comments that are basically constructive and positive about the future of the city. Uh, but I come back to what, uh, you know, really 
occupies my mind virtually all of the time, which is uh, how, uh, uh, you know, how the choices that I make and the choices that my uh, friends and colleagues and students make uh, influence and have the ripple effects throughout, the econ throughout our economy, throughout our society. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the questions that you see are asked, to, you know, predict the future. The future is for us to, uh, to create. And we do that with the decisions and the choices that we make. And we should tap into our deepest feelings and values in making those decisions. And I think we'll come out pretty good. That's, I love the end of that. That was great. Shrina, go to you and then Avis, but you got to keep it to like 15 seconds. I think Preet's ready. I would say cities are opportunities right now. They've always been a place where you can create and reimagine but at this juncture in time now we have an opportunity to rethink reflect and also rebuild and restructure our arrangements whether it's both in real estate infrastructure but ultimately how we interact with one another whether virtually or in person in the future that's great Avis no pressure but everybody that's still on your phrase is going to be the last thing they remember about this webinar okay well then I would say that we all just need to remember that this too shall pass our cities for thousands of years have encountered pandemics and we have always returned to the cities and just improved them based on what we lived through. This is a tough time, but this too shall pass and the city Great. will be here. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Preet. Okay. Thanks, Jim. And uh, thanks everyone this, uh, for uh, uh, putting together this panel and your very insightful and stimulating session. Uh, so I think we will end here. Uh, just a couple of notes, uh, and one is about our very exciting webinar on uh, on this Thursday, where we'll be welcoming Professor Don Thompson, who will be talking about luxury fashion in the time of COVID-19. So do join us uh, on Thursday. Uh, and finally, for uh, some of you all, uh, here, if you have any questions regarding our programs, about the webinar series, uh, about or about uh, admissions, please do get in touch. Uh, through any of those these beans and with that uh, again thanks uh, to all the panelists and thanks for everyone who joined us and hope to see you all on thursday bye